will give you a background to the Irish Wetland Bird Survey, its background, aims and objectives, methods, uh, the data collection and use, and similarly for the Countryside Bird Survey, um, the background methods, data requests and use of the data. Then we'll talk about our aim for bird monitoring scientific research network, the aims and opportunities, and finally we'll have a chance to all have a group discussion. Next. At this point, um, I'd like to invite um, our fantasy and PWS project officers to come in to give a few minutes talk. Hi everyone. Um, it's great to see such a good attendance for this inaugural event. And thanks to Leslie uh, for the introduction. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sinead Cummins and I work for the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And as Leslie has outlined, um, the Irish Wetland Bird Survey, also known as IWEBS, and the Countryside Bird Survey, also known as CBS, are two of Ireland's longest running ecological monitoring programmes. Both have not nationwide coverage and both a significant scientific citizen science input. These surveys, as Leslie's already alluded to, are funded by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and they're coordinated by the IWEBS office and the CBS office, both based at Birdwatch Ireland. Uh, my colleague Sean Kelly and I are, are both assigned to the birds unit of the science and biodiversity section of MPWS and part of our role involves continuing existing survey monitoring and research programs and also developing providing scientific advice on the conservation and management of bird populations. My own responsibility covers terrestrial bird species and thus I would be the lead contact for CBS in MPWS. Sean's remit will cover water bird species and Sean will be the lead contact for IWEBS and associated water bird surveys in, in MPWS. In terms of sort of IWEBS, the annual monitoring of the distribution and abundance of wintering water birds, it's been running since 1994 and thus far tw uh, 27 years in total of data, which is incredible. This survey monitors coastal wetland sites together with inland lakes, turlocks, rivers and callows. And together with associated surveys, this monitoring program provides data for up to 72 regularly occurring water bird species in Ireland and has been supported by many hundreds of volunteer counters over the years. Similarly, CBS has been running for a considerable length of time since 1998, with a total of 23 seasons completed. The aim of CBS is to measure change in bird numbers of countryside species. So the, this survey would be underpinned by the efforts of around 200 field surveyors, most of whom were volunteers. And therefore, it makes, you know, it, it's an example of one of Ireland's citizen science projects, biggest citizen science projects, probably charting the progress of over 50 terrestrial bird species and how they're doing in the Irish countryside. Thus, these sort of long term monitoring programs are, while rare, va incredibly valuable and becoming increasingly more so the more seasons data are kind of accruing under the belt, as it were. Um, both of the monitoring programmes satisfy major monitoring priorities for Ireland under Article 12 of the Birds Directive and support our, Republic, our reporting obligations under that directive. But furthermore, these surveys also allow us to detect impacts of environmental changes on key species groups. CBS for wider countryside species, including farmland birds, and IWEBS for, for water birds and wetland systems. Both surveys also feed into international monitoring programs. So CBS through PECOMS, which is the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme. And I know that Leslie will be talking a lot more about that later on in her presentation. And similarly for IWEBS via the EU Water Bird Monitoring Partnerships and networks, including Wetlands International. Thus the collection sort of analysis and reporting of these robust data are an integral part of, of conservation management in Ireland and ultimately will help us identify any changes in informed responses via direct management and or environmental policy. The success of these programs is down really to the tried and tested methods, standardized methods on the thousands, many thousands of hours of input from MPWS staff, Birdwatch Island staff, and the many hundreds of skilled volunteers that have contributed. So that's it from me. I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Sean Kelly for the remainder of the talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nate, and thanks, Leslie, for kicking us off today. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Sean Kelly. I'm a water bird ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> and as Sinead said, um, I suppose I'm the lead um, for the Irish Wetland Bird Survey on the NPWS side. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, 
and I'm glad to see so many numbers um, from such a, a variety of backgrounds here today. I think it's really, it's great to get us all together. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself really and just add a few additional points. Um, you know, that between iWebs and CBS, you know, they're both long-term ecological monitoring programs. They're huge data sets and um, they're entirely open for use. Um, they're free to use upon request. So, you know, they have a function for us uh, as, as a state body for kind of for various um, uh, purposes that Sinead has outlined and we'll hear more about today. But um, we think that there's probably further potential here, you know, to, to do a lot more. Um, and, and I suppose this is, comes down to a function of us kind of, I suppose, not really having the resources. We would like to do these all additional analyses and, and investigations. Um, but we're also aware that, you know, these data sets may have applications and areas that really may be beyond our array of expertise, for example, for, for people investigating areas of water quality um, or other uh, aspects of kind of agricultural systems. Um, so, I mean, it's good to get people together and, and kind of start discussing things more and sharing ideas. Um, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, there's lots of lots of questions and issues to investigate um, that are kind of pertinent to bird conservation more specifically, but environmental change and, and, and degradation more widely. Um, you know, investigations of, you know, climate change and, and how we can better manage kind of protected areas or, or certain areas of farmland in the future. Um, for example, for water birds, how we can kind of optimize our, our management of, of aquaculture in, in wetland sites to kind of minimize and avoid any kind of negative impacts. Um, and there's, there's some interesting work ongoing here. Um, and for example, you know, for CBS, could, could we, you know, we have a new rural development program or CAP strategic plan coming up and there's some big changes proposed here. And, you know, could we use the CBS to examine the success or otherwise of, of these, uh, these changes? So I, mean, I think these are, these are huge data sets. They're very powerful. Um, and I think they have a lot of uh, potential for further application. Um, and I mean, I think it's, it is really great to get us all here today. And this is just this is just step one, bringing people together and a bit of an advertisement, I suppose. And, um, you know, more discussions will come and more meetings. Um, but I suppose the main point of establishing the research network is, is to facilitate and support kind of research using these data sets. Um, ideally, from our perspective, that would inform um, conservation management and policy, whether at a national, local or, or kind of international scale. Um, and... I suppose what we're offering is where we're saying that these data sets are here, they're very high quality um, for, for a long time series and they cover national scales. And we have expertise both in National Parks and Wildlife Service as well as Birdwatch Ireland. And um, we're gonna make ourselves available to support and help uh, anyone who needs it in kind of the use of this data and, and provide our specialist knowledge of avian ecology, conservation issues, policy, policy gaps, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I mean, if people can come together and identify questions of interest and perhaps then, you know, we can help with supporting of, of funding applications, et cetera. I, I mean, I think there's just a lot of opportunity for everyone here and um, yeah, great to have us kicked off and looking forward to, to see the progression of this in the future. And I won't take any more of your time, but thank you. Next. Thanks, Sean. Back to me, I suppose I should introduce myself. So actually, I'm Leslie Lewis. Um, we're for Birdwatch Ireland, and I've been project manager of iWebs and CBS <clears throat> since uh, 2017. First off, why do we monitor birds? Well, as Ireland is a signatory to the EU Birds Directive, like other European countries, Ireland was. Um, obliged to identify sites of importance <clears throat> for birds and designate um, sites known as special protection areas under the EU Birds Directive. Along with this, um, where modern Ireland is also obliged to monitor and report under the directive at regular intervals, which is Article 12 reporting, which occurs um, on a cycle of about six years. And along with um, identifying and designating important areas for birds, then comes the need for long-term monitoring to be able to actually assess the trends and abundance and distribution of the species, 
which will then inform species and site protection and also help us to assess the effectiveness of any conservation measures put in place. Next. More wide, widely, birds are also known to be affected by wind indicators in that they reflect the health of the habitats and ecosystems in which they live. Compared to some other animal groups, birds are relatively visible and easy to survey. They're wide ranging and occur at the upper trophic level. And as such have been shown to be good environmental indicators for things such as climate change, changes in fish stocks, etc. Particularly when it comes to water birds and say wading birds, which are relatively um, visible and easy to survey when, when on intertidal areas. There's been a plethora of research really since the 1980s as well, using um, wading birds as a, as a means to um, look at theoretical ecology as well, things like foraging behavior and foraging theory. And also birds are conspicuous, they're aesthetically pleasing and a good advert for promoting biodiversity among the public. But also, I suppose, a good network of bird watchers, people who like to, to watch birds for, for hobby. Perhaps this also then lends itself to having a good base of, of people who, who become volunteers to help us monitor them. Next. So now I'm going to hand you over to uh, Dick Coombs, who will give us a background to bird monitoring in Ireland. Hello everybody, Dick Coombs is my name. I'm the Countryside Bird Survey Coordinator. I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, overview of the um, of, of surveying, bird surveying in, in Ireland. <clears throat> so let's go, go right back. Uh, I've got three examples here just to look at early uh, national surveys that were carried out in Ireland. The picture on the left shows three little turned chicks on a beach on, in the nest. And <clears throat> in 1969, 1970, uh, there was a massive undertaking called Operation Seafarer, which um, was a, a survey of all the seabirds around our coast and, and indeed even some inland species. But it was basically coastal seabirds, all the gannets and puffins and guillemots and kittiwakes, all that all counted. And so it was a huge, huge task for a couple of years to do that. And, and that was repeated actually several times uh, at maybe roughly 20 year intervals. <clears throat> and we also had in the middle there, we've got some, some waders and purple sandpipers. Uh, in, the early, in, in the late 1960s, there was the early version, if you like, of the current um, IWEBS, uh, the Birds of Estuaries Inquiry. That was, uh, you know, started as early as the late 1960s and has carried on since. <clears throat> and over on the right, we have uh, the Bird Atlas of, of Britain and Ireland. And that, that was a five-year project, another huge undertaking involving you know, large numbers of volunteers and, and, and people working out in the field. <clears throat> and that it was a five-year project, as I say, 1968 to 1972. And its aim was to um, plot all the uh, distribution of, of all the basically terrestrial species breeding in, in these islands. Next one. And just to show, let's go even further back. This is an, some old uh, handwritten notes taken on a survey that was done on the North Bull Island. And if you look at the next, uh, next slide, you'll see uh, it was actually in 1943, in the winter of 1943, 1944. So people have been keeping records for a long time and really the methods haven't changed hugely. It really involves people out in the field, making notes down on paper and eventually that gets uh, transferred into electronic format and analyzed and all the rest of it. Okay. Uh, there are lots of reasons why we need to monitor and why we need to watch populations of birds. <laughs> one, ex one example is to see, uh, to, to get some handle on what amount of hunting is sustainable. So monitoring, well, monitoring only means something if it's done over a sustained period of time, and that involves surveying, all well, the various surveys we have on the go. <clears throat> if you survey for long enough, um, over a period of time, you can then assess the, the status of, of a bird population or you know, a bird species or, or a site indeed. And um, that can, if you do it over, over time, we can, we can see changes. And that's the most important thing is to see what's happening, what changes are happening in the population. For example, we can see if a species is increasing or uh, stable or 
heaven forbid, if it's declining, that's something we have to keep an eye out for. Obviously, then the next step is to see if we can take action in terms of site protection, habitat management, or further research. Okay. So just, just to focus on one of those uh, early surveys, now there have been lots and lots of different types of surveys over the years, species focused ones like barn owls and corn crates and all sorts of things. But some of these, these major surveys uh, like the Atlas, as I say, a huge, huge job it was to, to try and for the first time plot the distribution of all the, the breeding birds in, in Britain and Ireland. So that was carried out in that, the first one was, was then in 68, 72. Another one was repeated, uh, the, the whole thing was repeated um, <clears throat> 20 years later. Now it's important to say the first one really did just concentrate on distribution. In other words, presence and absence and also proof of breeding. The second atlas uh, did the same thing, but it also included uh, abundance. In other words, people were to, there was a particular method for calculating the abundance of, of birds. And then that was repeated again 20 years later, um, more or less 20 years later. And that also covered uh, the distribution and abundance. So we can see that, you know, these have all come at 20 year intervals, uh, snapshots, if you like, of the mainly distribution, but it did also give us a, an idea of abundance and how it changed over oh, in these 20 year periods. <clears throat> there have also been two winter atlases to mention there too. Um, so again, just focusing on staying with the atlas, just to show what it can, sh uh, some changes that it can show, and indeed some alarming ones. And probably one of the most graphic ones is the, the Yellowhammer, a, a very iconic farmland bird, um, which has seen huge declines over the, over the 40 years of those atlases. And you can see here, all those gray dots, they're all 10 kilometer squares in which uh, yellowhammers were breeding or at least present. In fact, they're all fairly large dots that were breeding in those squares and they are not breeding now 40 years later. So that's, that's quite alarming. So if we look at the next slide, you can maybe see how um, quite graphically how, how the differences were for each year. First atlas, almost ubiquitous. Second atlas, huge gaps opening up 20 years later. And then the third atlas <coughs> shows uh, even greater gaps. And in fact, they've now kind of concentrated in the, the more more or less the southeastern half of the country and that tends to overlap with where uh, with the cereal growing areas uh, so they, they they are very much uh, tightly associated with with tillage and we, we have seen a huge move away from tillage in many parts of the country uh, to, to pasture to cattle grazing basically okay another example uh, a very stark uh, map to show all the gray dots indicate where curlews were found to be breeding in the first atlas and 40 years later they're now absent. The red dots incidentally show new sites so there's precious few of those but um, now there may be some others in between where they've been there since you know still there 40 years later but the overall picture there is, is decline and we can see the same um, with um, another species we can see a, sim a similar pattern but working the other way thankfully this is the common buzzard has made huge uh, increases in, in uh, over, over those 40 years. Uh, certainly when the first atlas was, was, was uh, carried out, there would only have been a handful of pairs up in, in Northern Ireland. And now we've seen them uh, all over the country. In fact, they're spreading beyond that now even. <clears throat> and then we come to another species, uh, the great spotted woodpecker is a brand new bird into Ireland basically. And, and this is what the atlas showed, the, that most recent atlas. So they're all dots where they are present um, and, and breeding, proved breeding. And in fact, that has increased since. So what all of this uh, leads to is uh, saying is that there, there's change, uh, change happening in bird populations. So it's, it's very important that we keep up uh, with those changes. So uh, the, really the main focus of, of this whole forum and, and today's session is, is on the two big, the big permanent uh, ongoing monitoring systems that we have uh, in train. And one of them is, is IWEBS, you've already heard, it's the Irish Wetland Bird Survey carried out during the winter, counts are once a month. And Neve will talk to you in a minute about, about that. And uh, the Countryside Bird Survey, the CBS, which is in the breeding season, it's, it, it only concerns the terrestrial breeding birds. <clears throat> Next. So to, to gather the data for all of any of these surveys, uh, we need lots of foot soldiers out there, lots of people on the ground uh, counting, and they are largely volunteers, but there are lots of National Parks and Wildlife Service rangers taking part. 
we have Birdwatch Ireland staff, and of course, uh, we have some contract field workers as well, <clears throat> all, all uh, gathering data to, to, to contribute to the surveys. And the two coordinators, well, Nee was going to talk to you now in a moment. Uh, she'll talk to you about iWebs. She's the coordinator there, and myself, the coordinator for the Countryside Bird Survey. And then in the background, of course, we have the we have Leslie, who's been speaking to you. She's the project manager. And we have Brian Burke and John Kennedy, scientific officers, who, who largely be involved with the analysis and data validation and a whole heap of other things. So there's a, a good team there between the five of us. <clears throat> so the timeline for these two, two big surveys, the, the iWebs takes pl place during the winter. So we see those, those are the core kind of winter months, but really it, it spans from September to March. So if anybody is really uh, crazy on, on surveys and they really want to continue on into the, into the spring, you'll notice that April, May, and June um, are very conveniently the months when CBS takes place. So you can, you can segue very nicely from March when doing your winter surveys out in the cold to the nice spring weather in April taking part in the survey. <clears throat> now the, the survey, the, the iWebs is once a month whereas the um, iWebs is, is just two counts have to be done between 1st of April and the end of June, and they should be either side of the 15th of May uh, for, for various reasons, partly to, to maybe in the late visit, you'll catch the summer migrants and the early visit to get some of the species that are more vocal in the spring. So uh, that's just to show you how you can fill your year with uh, surveying if you're a, a keen uh, a keen surveyor. So I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Neve, who's going to talk to you about iWebs. And it's very important that we all look at the methods. All these surveys obviously have methods that need to be followed. So uh, over to you, Neve. Thanks, Dick. Um, yeah, so as Dick said, I coordinate the Irish Wetland Bird Survey. Um, I have done since 2017, and it's a really impressive survey to work on. It's now in its 28th season, so it's a great long-running um, survey. And it has four main objectives. Um, the first of which is to determine the size of our water bird populations. For the purpose of this sur survey, water birds include wildfowl, wildfowl allies, waders and gulls. Um, and then these estimates are then also used to identify which sites are important for supporting these populations, um, to assess the changes in water bird numbers and distribution over time. And then all of this information is utilized to, to better inform decision making, um, for example, uh, designating sites and um, feeding into what appropriate uh, developments might be appropriate near wetland sites. Ireland is so important for water birds, um, by and large, because of our location along the kind of migration highway called the East Atlantic Flyway. Um, so each winter, hundreds and thousands of water birds um, come to our wee island from their Arctic uh, nesting grounds. Um, and as their northern breeding grounds freeze over, they're enticed here by our mild climate and lots of ice-free uh, feeding opportunities at wetland sites across the country. So their aim is to spend as much time here as they can feeding and bulking up for the journey home and hopefully a, breed, a successful breeding season um, the following summer. And on the next slide then, um, you can see the, the outline of this um, East Atlantic flyaway. So you can see we share these populations with a lot of other countries and it's a large part of why it's important um, to, to monitor them and make sure that we're maintaining wetlands, that, uh, the wetland sites that are so important for their conservation. Um, some species just funnel through on their way to, um, to or from Africa, such as passage migrants like uh, Wimbrel, whereas many other species stay throughout the, the winter. Um, next. Now, how do we go about monitoring these water birds? Well, it's a very straightforward um, just look-see method. So the birds are just counted within predefined boundaries once a month from September through to March. There's a particular emphasis on January because this is the month when a lot of species numbers peak. And also this data is used by the International Water Bird Census as well. Um, for consistency, um, teams cover large sites and on our near uh, selected count dates. We try to stick to uh, the high end of rising at tidal sites and each site is counted within three hours. Next. 
So across the country, we have around 300 um, iWeb sites, and this includes the majority of our special protected areas. As, as you mentioned, a lot of these were designated based on um, largely based on iWeb's data. These are then further um, subdivided um, in a lot of areas into roughly 800 subsites, including wetlands of all different types from wet grassland to a uh, shallow coastline. So as you can imagine, it takes a huge amount of effort to cover these sites. Um, and thankfully, we have about 485 boots on the ground year in, year out, made up of MPWS staff, Birdwatch Ireland staff, and hundreds of volunteers, um, both skilled and very dedicated. And we're incredibly grateful for everybody's contribution to the survey because um, they, you know, they go out rain, hail, or shine um, every year to survey these incredibly important populations and their wetland sites. Next. Um, so yeah, one of the ways we, we keep consistency with the areas that we're counting over time is to predefine the boundaries within which we um, count these sites. And these a lot of these are then further subdivided into smaller count units, which is useful to us, um, not just in coordinating counts. Go to the next slide, please. Um, as you can easily kind of divide um, count areas up between different people, but it also allows us um, from a data point of view to have much finer scale um, data and a better idea of what areas are important for birds within a site. As you can see with Dundalk here, um, some areas, some subsites are better for um, nationally important uh, numbers of Blacktail goblet, whereas the other areas might be better for the likes of light tail belly brank goose. So having this um, kind of finer scale data tells us a lot more and helps us to further inform um, the likes of developments and assets, uh, applications. And we're, um, we don't, there's always going to be some things we don't capture to, to quite as high a level as, as we might want to inform on these populations. For example, a lot of geese and swans use um, grassland areas to feed and therefore might not be captured by um, the core iWeb sites. So we also run additional surveys, either just through iWebs or in collaboration with other groups and organizations. Some of these um, are run on an annual basis and others are run on a cyclical basis, um, such as the International Swan Census, that a lot of you probably heard about um, back in January of 2020. So that's just a quick overview of the long running and incredibly important iWebs. So now I'll hand you back over to Dick to give you a brief rundown on the equally important and slightly younger countryside bird survey. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um... CBS is, uh, is only on the go since um, 1998, so 22, 23 years under our belt there, so um, kind of interesting. Okay, uh, just to look at the right-hand side of the slide here, <clears throat> um, you can see uh, a map of uh, the map of Ireland. Uh, it's the distribution of REN in the bird atlas. Now, if you were to look at any of the, those three atlases done at 20-year intervals, that map would look almost identical because wren is pretty it's ubiquitous and it's it's very common and even if the population went down a bit those dots would, would still stay in the same places more or less so it wouldn't tell you too much by showing uh you know three maps of that like so with the yellow hammer uh <clears throat> look to the left hand side you can see um down at the bottom left you'll see that uh, what cbs does is it fills in the gaps so instead of that 20 year gap we've only got one year gaps the, and, and, it's, and the other thing, of course, about CBS is that it, it focuses entirely on, 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 the, on abundance, uh, although the Atlas does do abundance as well, but we won't go into that now. So CBS, uh, you can see there, we can fill in the gaps and we can see a very interesting trend there. Those little dots each represent um, how RANs were doing in relation to the base year, 1998, on the left-hand side of the... Of the, of, the, of the graph. And you, some of you may see there's a huge big, uh, you may have noticed there's a very big drop there around about 2010, 2011. And that was following two very cold winters. So very graphically, we could see that the population of wrens were, were badly hit in Ireland and, and, the, and the, uh, the graph dips down. So, so that's what CBS is all about is, is plotting the changes, the ups and downs 
of the stability of bird po of terrestrial bird populations in, in Ireland, and that is the main aim of the CBS is to do that. So how do we how do we know the numbers? How do we count the, the birds? Well, obviously we don't count all the wrens and robins and blue tits and blackbirds and whatever. We 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 sample them. We 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 have a number of uh, sample sites across the country, and this map here just shows you that uh, in 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 Ireland we all of the um dark blue areas they are 10 kilometer squares all the 10 kilometer squares in which we have a sample site and, uh, and so you can see there's a bit of a um bias if you like towards the east but the, the way the selection of squares is designed uh, it makes it makes sure that there is still a representative amount of squares across the rest of the country next slide so here we look a bit closer at, at the 10 kilometer squares and we mentioned that there's only one site per square uh, made available and it's the southwest corner so there's 100 one kilometer squares in each of those 10k squares so the only ones we look at are the ones in the bottom left hand corner the, the southwest corner <clears throat> and if we look in more detail at those you can see little squiggles little lines on those um uh, in, in those squares and many of you will be familiar with transects uh, a, a very tried and tested way of, of measuring populations. And the whole idea is you walk these two transects, which should be roughly straight and roughly parallel, but they often twist and bend like this. If you have to work with the topography of the landscape and gates and so on to get through. So um, you, you walk along and you can see that split into 200 meter sections. And you, you walk along these, do, you do it in the early morning, you count the birds you hear and see along the transects. And the whole idea is not to count all the birds within the square because you won't possibly do that, but only the birds you see along the transects. Next one. So there's another example of transects going across the landscape and you can see the 200 meter sections are in different colors there. And we put in gray just an area to either side of the transect, that's the 25 meter band. So people have to roughly calculate the bird they heard or saw uh, is it within the 20, is it within 25 meters of where I'm walking? They also have to then decide on the next band, which is 25 to 100 meters away from the transect. Uh, it's only a rough measure. And then of course, anything that's beyond the 100 meters, quite often they'd be large birds seen in the distance or maybe heard away off in the distance. So that's all recorded then onto your field sheet. And you can use the species codes or you can put it in longhand so long as you can read your own writing. And that can get transferred onto another sheet or onto an online data entry later on. <clears throat> okay. So just to recap, CBS is carried out April, May, June. You do two counts, one either side of the 15th of May, but about a month apart. And the whole idea is that you can catch uh, late, later migrants, maybe in the late visit, and uh, in the early visit, maybe some of the more vocal species. Two, it's carried out in the early morning, so between six and nine o'clock. And the whole idea of, particularly with CBS, is consistency to do this, count the same transects, the same, as near as Dammit, the near at the same dates each year, and always to be doing it at that, that time of the morning between six and nine. So that cuts out as many variables as possible. And you try to do it in good weather as well. So uh, any changes in the numbers of birds, the cumulative effect of, of putting all the 300 odd squares together uh, will, will tell us whether there's a change in the populations. <clears throat> Um, we, we have set a threshold of 300 squares and we usually achieve a bit over that each year and that's considered to be a very good sample, sample size. Roughly 220 participants each year uh, take part and of course that we get a turnover of them so we're constantly having to recruit new people. And the important thing is that uh, any species that occurs in 30 squares or more is considered to be monitorable. In other words, we can stand over it and say, yeah, we can produce a trend on that. So we have something in the region that varies a little bit, but between 50 and 55 species of common and widespread birds in Ireland, uh, uh, we, we can now produce uh, CBS trends for. Next slide. And of course, um, because of the random nature of the, of the, the squares, the way they're selected, um they can fall anywhere on uh, you know and they can fall in all kinds of habitats and all kinds of places but um the vast majority of them will be in in, in farmland so of some sort at least anyway so i think that uh oh yeah habitat uh, habitat recording is another aspect of cbs 
uh, it's something that we'd like to see if there's any changes, particularly just like with the bird populations, if there are any obvious changes in habitat, broad sweeping changes, uh, you can click on there. Uh, it'll it'll uh, demonstrate um, or, or perhaps uh, give us some idea of why a particular species is declining. For example, if an area had been in, uh, in, in cereal, uh, and suddenly a few years later, it's turned over to, uh, to grassland uh, for, for grazing and suddenly yellowhammers disappear, a very obvious correlation. We look at the main habitats there, just very broad sweep habitats. Uh, some people don't like filling up the habitat sheets, but uh, there you go. Uh, then we take it to another level, we take it to the finer detail of the actual land usage and down to details like were there hedgerows uh, with trees or without trees, uh, was there what was the water quality like? A few little bits and pieces, fairly simple habitat um, codes to fill out uh, in each of your 200 meter sections. And that gives us a, a, you know, a, an idea of, of the main habitat. It's all to do with the, the broad dominant habitat that to fill out, but there's also an opportunity to fill out a, a secondary habitat. In other words, if the, if the transect happened to go close to in this case, a coniferous woodland up on the uh, on the hillside, uh, that would go in as a secondary habitat because that, that would be reflected in the birds you're recording in that area. You might be picking up things like coal tits and gold crests and so on. So that's a quick uh, little soft view of the methods for um, the CBS. I'll hand you back over to Leslie now to talk about data inputs and uses. Thanks, Dick. Next slide, please, John. Hi, so if we return to iWebs, well, we have a main central repository of data as such in the master iWebs database. And in this, we have site and subsite data for roughly 300 sites per winter season from 1994-95, so that's the winter, to current. So roughly 28 seasons of data within the database. Actually, looking in the database, however, uh, we actually have data for over 170 water bird species. So while uh, obviously a lot of these aren't regularly occurring, that we have data, that's probably untapped data of other species, rarities, et cetera, within the database. And we also have data for 77 other species of bird, which are, are outside the, the water bird definition, if you like. Um, so when surveyors are out, they'll also record things like raptors and seabirds and other interesting species. Along with the count data itself, so that's number of birds counted, um, the surveyors also assign quality codes. So, um, so we can have a good idea, and it's particularly important when it comes to analyses later on, whether the data are good or poor. For instance, things like you know, bad weather conditions changing during a count or something could affect count quality. And also by the nature of counting large numbers of birds, sometimes you know, counts may not be as accurate as we'd like them to be, so they could be marked as, as underestimate. So all these kind of data are in the database as well, along with accessory data, such as date, site type, and board habitat, um, whether sites are coastal, inland, tidal state, when the, the counts were collected, the survey conditions, and also things like levels of disturbance at the time the count was carried out. So there's a whole load of data there surrounding very important count data, which um, could be potentially very useful. In addition to the main database, then we've also um, touched on this complementary um, surveys. And of course, we have data sets here for things like post breeding terns, um, the geese, the grey lags and the pink footed, and also the international swan census as well. Next, please. And these data, well, they're very, very important to us at national level. And we've already um, discussed the, the importance in terms of the SPA designations, um, but they're also important at perhaps more local level, site level, national and international level. And I suppose what I want to highlight here in this slide is that the, the core of this, or the basis of this data set, these data sets, are the IWEBS counters themselves. So we're hugely grateful to, to the volunteers. And I suppose it's a good point to add in here now that if anybody listening that would like to become a volunteer counter, uh, then please do get in touch. Next, please. So within the project, we undertake um, regular analyses 
and particularly um, focusing on estimates and trends of water bird numbers. But the count methods itself enables us to um, undertake various analyses and modelling process to actually come up with estimated numbers of water birds wintering in Ireland. You can see some um, examples of publications here. Um, a lot of the reporting is, is centred around Article 12, so with roughly five, six year intervals, we'll be producing kind of quite large um, in detail um, assessment documents. The data also lend themselves to other uses and perhaps one of the most um, recent and important uh, uses was the Birds of Conservation Concern Assessment, which was uh, published in spring this year. This is our um, traffic light system of assigning birds to red, amber or green. That's high, moderate or um, good, good status as such. And uh, as many of you know, um, we have now more red listed species in Ireland than ever. So ever more reason to, to monitor and keep track of these birds. Next, please. We also send our data internationally to the International Waterbird Census. Um, and this organization collects data from all over, all over the Europe, uh, Europe and the world, indeed. And given that waterbirds are such a well-monitored um, species worldwide, they can actually produce um, um, population estimates at uh, international level. Um, which is it's quite some task actually. I think water birds are fairly probably unique as an animal group to have such high level analyses such as population estimates at international level. Next. Along with um, population estimates, uh, the IWC also undertake regular conservation status um, assessments and reporting. Um, along with estimates, again, they can produce uh, population trends for um, Europe and internationally, and also um, do things, or prepare things like EU multi species indices and critical site network tools. Next, please. Coming on to data requests. Well, as, as already been alluded to much, much earlier in, in the presentation, the, da the database and the data are actually freely available um, for use on request. And we currently have two main types of, of data requests, one being academic for its research purposes, and the second being what I suppose I consider to be general or commercial. Of those two, the general commercial data request would be um, far more numerous than the academic requests. Um, these would be related to, say, consultancies um, obtaining data to feed into ecological impact assessments as part of appropriate assessment or environmental impact assessment. These general commercial data requests are serviced through an online data request platform, which is, um, can be found within the uh, iWeb's web pages on the Birdwatch Island website. And basically, somebody just fills in their name, contact details. Um, and the data that they're looking for at site and subsite level. And within about a two week period, um, data is sent out. The academic requests go through a different process, sorry, back, um, whereby um, the academic student or whatever fills in a form of proposed use of the data and outputs. This is then assessed by the project steering group once um, agreed, then the data are sent out along with, um, well, actually both types of data requests are sent out with terms and conditions and also several guidance documents as to informing people basically what sort of data they're getting, how to, how to um, assess them and, and terms and conditions of use. So while I suppose um, the, the general commercial data requests are the most numerous, um, we also have data requests that feed into to other things such as planning and policy, um, many locally led studies or biodiversity groups or people sometimes that are just interested in what birds occur on the local patch and, and like bird watching and like to find out what, what has been found at a site um, during the monitoring process. We also feed in um, at times to other government departments uh, as well as the National Parks and Wildlife. An example there would be giving support and, and information sometimes 
to Dafem on, on say key huge water bird sites and where there are large aggregations of water birds during winter and where there be, may be a risk there when we sadly get um, influxes of avian influenza. Next. When it comes to the, the academic data requests as such, this is perhaps one reason why, why we're here today. We, we don't get that many. Um, and some recent examples here, these are uh, largely um, undergraduate or um, postgraduate studies using iWebs data. And I suppose another, another good example of the use of iWebs data are ongoing studies and research um, undertaken by the Marine Institute and their consultants on the assessments of interactions between water birds and aquaculture. Next. In contrast to national research, however, as we send our IOWEBS data to the International Water Bird Census, they, they also support a data request process. And this is basically any research team um, in the world can, can um, request data from the IWC um, and you know, worldwide data or European data and of course IWEBS data feed into that. So therefore have, have fed into some high level research done over the years. This slide shows a flavor of, of scientific papers that have been published in recent years using IWC data, but of course, these are also including IWEBS data. Um, interesting point here is that all of these recent papers have a common theme in that they're all linked to climate change research. Next, please. And similarly for the country side bird survey, talk now about the data, the database, our master database. Like iWebs, another amazing, amazing uh, database. We have breeding season count data for roughly 300 squares per year from 1998 to current. The, the time series of data um, sadly isn't 100% complete through no fault of our own, but sadly in 2001, foot and mouth prevented survey work, and of course, most recently, 2020, when uh, COVID-19 prevented uh, survey week, survey work. But apart from that, um, yeah, the data right back to 1998. So within this survey, we're looking at detailed count data, for bird species recorded within four distance bands, 10 transect sections within each one kilometer square, with two replicate visits per year. Now, while we have roughly say about 55 common regularly occurring species and around about 50, 52 that we um, are common enough that we can um, produce trends for, we actually are looking found that we have data for 172 species in the database. So there's obviously a good uh, sprinkling of, of rarities uh, um, being picked up there as well. And again, data that's been completely untapped um, to date. And along with count data, again, we have the accessory data, like date, survey conditions, and of course, the, the high level habitat data as well, which again is an example of data that hasn't been used to a very great extent uh, previously. Like iWebs, we publish um, regular reports. And as Dick has already alluded to, that was the key aim of the Countryside Bird Survey is to assess how species are doing so our key, key analysis would be to produce trends. So sorry there if you can hear a donkey praying in the background. Um, our trends there, an example is that the graph there of the common kestrel. So trends are produced by basically producing an, an annual index, which is summing the species peak counts in a square and then across nationally. These are uh, modelled in, in a statistical package called TRIM, which can account for sort of missing values. And then um, basically indices are plotted against year and you can visualise the trends in the species. So we produce regular trend reports and regular five to six year assessments as well, generally linked to Article 12. We also produce something called um, wild bird indicators, the graph in the bottom left there. And a wild bird indicator is essentially um, sort of an aggregate or a composite index whereby the indicator shows the year-to-year -year fluctuations 
in the population trends of the species that are included in the, in the analysis. And by this way, the indicator shows or it serves to indicate how species are doing within the broad habitat which you're looking at. In Ireland, we're producing um, indicators for, for common birds and also for common farmland birds, as you can see there. And we have indicator pages within the CBS pages um, on the Birdwatch Ireland website. Next, please. And like we send IWEBS data to the International Water Bird Census, we also send our CBS data to Europe as well, to what we um, call familiarly the PECAMS, or the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Survey. They collate, collect and collate data from all over Europe and do similar, similar analyses to ours, actually it's a very standardized way of analyzing these data to produce um, trends of common breeding bird species across Europe and also um, indicators as well. Next. We also serve as data requests for um, the Countryside Bird Survey. Um, unlike iWebs, actually, however, data requests for Countryside Bird Survey are, are much, much reduced or, or lower in number. Um, the top points here show recent examples of some university studies, but they're, they're few and far between actually in terms of these, these data being used in studies. Most recently, um, John Kennedy um, used CBS data along with um, other data sets to explore Yellowhammer data distribution. John's on our team and we'll get to talk to him later. We have other, um, I think an ongoing um, PhD at the moment on um, drivers declines in the Kestrel and um, Olivia Crow, who formerly worked on the CBS and iWebs projects, used data um, to produce these two papers here as part of her PhD. We also have some um, examples of current ongoing studies at the bottom of this slide, um, one being the farmland bird hotspot mapping, which is um, a Birdwatch Ireland project. But by and large, uh, CBS data requests are far fewer than the iWeb's data requests. Um, and CBS data requests are generally serviced by, um, we have a, a data request form, people just fill in um, their projects and, and why they need to use the data. This uh, form is then assessed by the project steering group um, once approved data is sent out. Thank you. And perhaps for CBS, actually, um, more data requests come internationally than, than nationally because we send the data again to Peckham's. They, they in turn, um, have their own data request service for European data as a whole. So um, we just, um, in the CBS office, we approve the use of, of the data in international research projects and then the data are used. They can be used in... Our CBS data can end up being used in, in research projects worldwide, including the United States. And these are just some examples here of uh, previous research studies that have published paper and those that are in progress. Thank you. So that's really a background to the projects, the outputs, how we use the data outputs, and also how the data could potentially be uh, used or what data are there that could potentially be used in the future. And now to come on to, as with the aim today, which is our, our aims and vision of a bird monitoring scientific research network. Next, please. So we're literally sitting on 28 seasons of data for iWebs and a roughly 22 years of data for common and widespread breeding birds within Ireland. So we have two high quality long-term data sets covering two major systems, farms and wetlands in Ireland. And I think we've alluded to this quite a few times, but these data are freely available for use on request and obviously with some conditions attached. So as a, a network, we would, we'd like to think that we could promote and facilitate and drive ornithological, ecological, and environmental research, or even apl applied research 
you know, we're open, open, very much open to ideas here, and that this would utilize these what we consider to be amazing data sets to investigate the questions and issues that are pertinent to biodiversity management and policy. Next. So we see this network of really being open to, to anyone, scientists, researchers, private researchers, ecologists, policymakers, statisticians, um, doesn't have to be ornithologists, you know, across the range, um, and set up a network of people that can come together to collaborate um, on research using these two data sets. But the, in the background, um, we're also therefore offering the specialist input guidance and support from the IWEBS and CBS project team and the MPWS um, project officers. Next. So we envisage that we could host this network and also support the network. For instance, um, we can assist and support in, in, in funding applications. So if a research group want, wish to use the data, we can you know, obviously agree that before funding applications are put in, which may often help uh, with such applications. The network, could, example, could discuss, identify and drive collaborative research projects, get together and, and talk, brainstorm key research questions in area where areas where research is most needed and propagate research projects, again, with input and guidance from the IWEBS and CVS office and teams. We see the network of being able to explore new ideas and also help us with these projects into the future. They've been running a long time, but we see, see them as running well into the future. So new technologies, new ways in which we could capture and use the data or analyze the data and brainstorming and exploring these ideas would be great too. We see the network could meet at regular intervals to network, talk, brainstorm, update on, on ongoing research using the data, and perhaps maybe an annual meeting where people could come together for more networking, collaboration building, where researchers or, or students using the data could uh, present their work in an informal situation uh, and get backup and guidance from the network. Thank you. Next, please. So as a final slide, before we um, enter into a question or a discussion session, we just thought we'd pose what we think might be the current res research priority issues at the moment. Um, and for water birds, we're thinking certainly the impacts and the effects, potentially interactions of aquaculture and water birds is something that um, deserves um, attention going forwards, uh, and we've already alluded to the fact that um, there is research going on in this area, but um, more would certainly be welcomed. Climate change is a massive issue now, key issue for both water birds and our countryside birds. And recreational and other disturbance has been a, an issue for our water bird populations um, for many years, and it certainly is an area of research that um, still needs still needs work. We still need to get um, a handle on how to um, have coastal and recreational area around wetlands in a sustainable manner. In terms of countryside birds, like I already said, climate change is a huge issue, but also the effects of change in land use and agricultural intensification are key issues. Um, and also things like relationships with landscape features. They say within the CBS, um, very little work has been done with the habitat data that's been collected over the years. And also we, we have gaps in things like regional trends. Um, you know, we produce trends of species at national level, but actually for both water birds and countryside birds, um, regional trends will be coming um, very important things to look at in it, so it's certainly in light of climate change in recent in future years. Next. So that was our formal presentation. We're more or less on time. Um, we're due to run to half past three. So we've got roughly you know, 25 minutes for uh, to open the floor up. Um, the whole team are here, myself, Dick, Neve, Brian, John, our project officers with 
WS, uh, Sean and Sinead. So we're very happy to answer any questions you might have. There's, there's one comment in the um, chat there, Leslie from Tom Gittings, that another priority should be the impact of hunting on Waterbridge populations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He thinks something that's probably never been looked at in Ireland yet, particularly. Um, can anyone else come in there? But to my knowledge, um, I know there was some uh, some localized work done at the Wild File Reserve down in Wexford on the whooper swans getting hit with lead poisoning and that, but not not hunting pressure. Yeah, no good points. I, I, I've raised that point, um, not just for the impact in terms of uh, taking, you know, killing birds, but also the disturbance impacts uh, in Cork Harbour. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in recent winters is in, in the Iowa count, we're starting to observe quite a lot of impact from disturbance impacts from wildfowl. And that when you have wildfowl taking place, quite a count going on. You can see it had really major impacts on, on the water birds. They, they react very, very strongly and they remain disturbed for a long period of time after. Mm. Um, so this is an issue actually I've been raising, raising with MPW staff in Cork Harbour and I've asked the question as to whether or not uh, a further assessment is required for the licensing of hunting in state owned foreshore. Um, because, of, because while the while the uh, taking of, of, of quarry species is covered by the derogation under the birds directive, my contention would be that the licensing of hunting is, a, is an activity, you know, the disturbance impacts on other mm. species are not covered by the derogation, so that should require further assessment. But clearly, it's an issue that would require further research to provide the kind of data as to whether this act whether or not it's an issue. Good point, Tom. I mean, disturbance, I, I think, is one of the key issues with water birds and, and our declines. I mean, maybe a lot of people don't know in the audience here, but you know, our winter water bird populations have declined enormously, um, almost about 40% over the last 20, 25 years. So, you know, there's there's got to be cumulative impacts here of, of disturbance from lots of lots of different things, you know, not just, you know, I suppose we often point the finger at human recreational disturbance and particularly, you know, dogs, loose dogs chasing birds or whatever. But when it comes to water bird sites, I think it's cumulative.